Well, I'm recording now, so. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome to the December 22nd, uh, 2020 session of Tangerine SDR and uh, Hamsai Personal Space Weather Station uh, meetings. My name is Dave, KV0S, and this week I've been doing a little bit of programming uh, back on the um, uh, discovery and uh, loading of software. I'm building a set of tools for that and uh, making sure everything works properly and going back to my uh, open HPSDR code. So I've been doing that. And then the other day I was talking with my uh, former director and he mentioned that um, the people from Boulder got the magnetometer installed in Columbia. So there's now a research grade magnetometer, uh, oh, maybe five miles from both Dave, both Dave's houses. <laughs> and so, I asked, I wrote to Dolores and asked if we could have access to the data. And she said that I need, she was going to contact um, Jennifer Gammon. I don't know if you know her, uh, Nathaniel, but. Uh, and it's she, Daniel. Huh? Daniel. Daniel. Yep. And uh, she's the PI on this magnetometer project. So. Uh, but it sounds like they might be willing to share the uh, data. They were talking about, so the sensor was put in sometime in the fall, November, December, and they're talking about uh, having a data source available in January. So as soon as I find out something, we, we'll pass it along, but we have uh, currently Two, mag two of our magnetometers running full time here in Col Columbia. And then we have one in, in New York, of course. And hopefully, uh, uh, Homan will uh, get his going soon. And so we're gr uh, gradually accumulating data and we'll soon be able to uh, uh, have several sites. And I'm, I'm assuming it's OK to share our data with, with them if they want it. So that's it for me. Next on the list is Nathaniel, W2NAF. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, it's been a busy week for me. Uh, I've mostly been working on writing reports, and I just about have the re annual report for this DAISY done. Um, and I think, human, I'm not sure if you're on the line um, when I said before. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, input. Uh, I am going to be putting it in tomorrow, so I will definitely keep your text in there. So thank you very much. Uh, W2NAF, back to Matt. Fine business. Next on the list is uh, Dave, uh, KD0EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello. I've been mostly just writing code, Python code mostly, um, this week, um, sitting here grinding my teeth and reading documentation and I'm a little out of date on some some of the things so um, just the usual for me uh, nothing nothing very exciting here um, that's it I think fine business and next on the list we have Bill AB4 EJ uh, go ahead Bill hey thanks Dave good evening to you and good evening to the net um, I worked on something that turned out to be relatively unproductive this week. Uh, I was trying to write a little interface to go between the local host, which now can output UDP data that um, GNU Radio can read. And I wanted to write a little interface to be able to push this data to Spectrum Lab, Spec Lab, which is a Windows uh, based program. Well, they give a couple of different options for how to do this. There's something called WM copy data, which is a memory transfer mechanism. Um, I was able to get a couple of programs to push data back and forth. 
between two programs that t test programs that I was working with, but I was never able to get Spectrum Lab to pay any attention to or acknowledge the data I was trying to send it. So, all right. So there's another thing that they say you can supposedly do. Um, there is a way you can set up Spectrum Lab to act, so they say, either as a receiver of TCP raw data or as a server. And I couldn't, I'm, I'm able to push data to it, but there is virtually no documentation on how to format it. So it, it gets some data and then it hangs up because it, uh, you know, it, it gets, doesn't understand the, the, the layout of the data. And I've tried various ways uh, that trying to interpret the documentation, which is very sparse as how to format. Oh, it looks like there's two headers. There's one like a stream header and then another thing that looks like a VT49, but they don't say, does that go in a separate block or it's just, so I, I, I probably burned and wasted four days working on that. I'm, I'm putting that aside for now because it, it's not really that important, but I thought it would be nice, you know, to have a complimentary product to go along with GNU radio. If you could, because Spectrum Lab has so many other cool features that it'd be fun to be able to work, use Spectrum Lab with the local host. But uh, uh, if somebody knows how to do that, I wish somebody would contact me because otherwise it's going to take a good deal more research. I have quite a bit of non-working code generated. So anyway, that's that was my wasted week. Back to net. Well, sounds <laughs> like an interesting project, but uh, maybe find a bright uh, graduate student to sick on that one. <laughs> We don't have this isn't Princeton. We we don't have <laughs> graduate students who actually know how to do anything here. Oh, okay. Uh, if you want somebody who knows how to do something, you get somebody who's a sophomore in CS, and okay, they will come in and develop anything you want because they've been coding since they were in sixth grade. But mm -hmm. anyway, <laughs> well, very good. Uh, next on the list, we have Dan in for XWE. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, thank you, Dave, and hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm yes. losing packets right and left here. Okay, so um, I worked on scripts this week of note. Uh, the last one I worked on got working pretty well is um, for the end the Odroid N2. And it is uh, Dave Witten's uh, free DV GUI and all the associated uh, audio codec stuff that comes along with it, including uh, LPC net, which is a neural uh, intelligence thing that uh, allows uh, the FreeDV GUI to do a couple of the more obscure modes in FreeDV. Um, also of interest is I have GNU radio scripts for both the Raspberry Pi and for the Odroid. And they seem to work really well. I've run both of them a couple of times. They take about uh, three and a half hours to compile on the Raspberry Pi and the Odroid, Raspberry Pi 4 and the Odroid. It takes about six and a half hours to compile on the Raspberry Pi 3. And I'm not so sure that it's real useful. Once you've compiled it on the 3 on the 4, it seems to be very useful. Anyway, that was kind of my effort for the week. And uh, that's about it from here. Back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. Uh, are you putting those on uh, GitHub? They are on GitHub and they are reachable by github.com uh, slash N4XWE. I haven't, I, I know Git pretty well. I don't know the GitHub uh, <laughs> webpage workings very well. And I haven't quite figured out how to make them searchable from the search line on GitHub. So, but if you just do uh, github.com slash N4XWE, it'll take you right to the to yeah. my front page. And if you and, want a real uh, challenge, they're available for you. if you want a real challenge, see if you can make a script that will generate uh, GNU radio so where it runs on Windows. <laughs> I'll meet you in 18 months. So you can yeah. do it. So yeah, Roger, just, I understand. And I understood. mean version 3.8 too. Version 3.8, not so, know, yeah. something. That's so, some time for the next good release. Luck. Yeah. So Dan, I'll try to uh, link your code up 
in the Tangerine SDR web pages, if I haven't already. Okay, great. Yeah. And the versions I have compiled are 3.8.2. So okay. it is the latest and greatest version. Okay. And I've also included uh, the Osmo SDR, which, and also uh, the HP SDR code that uh, Tom McDermott did, that is the interface for uh, it, open HP SDR stuff. Okay. They, they compile. There actually are two versions. One doesn't have the Osmo SDR and the HP SDR. The other one does. Anyway, okay. back to you. Okay. Very good. Uh, next on the list, let's see, uh, David Mack, uh, N1HAC, right? Yes, uh, didn't get my uh, thing updated, but that's okay, you know me. Um, been working on uh, HF radios and VLF radios, but uh, pre-tangerine things that I hope um, ultimately Tangerine would replace. But uh, setting up a VLF receiver here and uh, HF receiver for out in the field. So back to net. Fine business. And next on the list is Dev. Uh, go ahead, Dev. He's got a, he's on the telephone. So I guess, he can't talk, or can he? We'll go on. Oh, oh sorry, you got sorry, it working, sorry, Dev? Was, yeah, it is. Is it working? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I was I was on I was muted. Okay. So we are we are getting closer to the holidays, and we have few talks uh, set for ourselves for the holidays, as we had a good discussion last Friday with a group of. Uh, experienced ionospheric physicists, space physicists, to, to understand the data that we have collected here at here in Scranton. So we have our talks cut out and we're trying to see if we can get something more tangible in the near future. Thank you. Okay, very good. And next on the list, we have Gary, AF8A. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, not much to add. Just want to wish everyone uh, a happy winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere and, uh, and back to net. Fine business. And next on the list is Greg, VA3CBN. Go ahead, Greg. I'm just listening in. Uh, nothing to report. Very well. Good. Welcome, Greg. And next on the list is Homan. Homan, I don't remember your call sign, so. <laughs> oh, KD2MCR, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, nothing in particular to report. Uh, it's been a very busy week for me. I'm still actually proctoring my exam. That's still going on. Um, oh. Just looking at, looking at the WebEx and uh, the web-based uh, exam system right now. Uh, anyway, I'm working on the instruction manual, uh, the installation manual, uh, based on uh, what Dave Witten and uh, Jules provided me. Uh, and I'm still expecting to receive a package from Scotty. Uh, so based on what I see from this uh, package uh, with the, all the pipes and stuff, I'll try to establish more concrete um, installation manual. Um, but otherwise, yep, that's all I have to say for this week. Back to net. Very good. And let's see, next on the list is James KG4DSG. Go ahead. You got me? Yep. Yep. Got audio. Okay. Yeah, I'm just listening in. I uh, missed the meeting last week, but I saw the uh, the recap. So uh, back to net. Fine business. So next on the list is Jonathan, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't have uh, too much to report this week. Um, I, uh, I, was, I was very busy with uh, work. 
uh, back to the net. Fine business. And next on the list, we have Michael, A-A-A-K. Go ahead, Michael. Well, thanks very much. Uh, greetings to everyone <laughs> on the conference. Thank you. So it's Michael in the hat, right? <laughs> so next on the list, we have Scotty, W-A-2, D-F-I. Hello there, Dave and the group. I like your hat there, uh, Mike. That's uh, <clears throat> you can stash a lot of stuff up there that nobody can see. <laughs> it would be, uh, at least at least one or two SDRs up uh, under your hat. Anyway, this week's been really uh, not good. Uh, I've been under the weather most of the week, so I haven't got much of anything done except just trying to rest and and uh, get back above the weather. And uh, fortunately, it was 70 degrees today, so it's kind of nice outside compared to what I hear. I guess the last time I talked to Nathaniel, he was in the middle of a blizzard. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that's it for here. Back to you, Dave. Fine business. And next on the list, we have Tom in 5EG. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, good evening, Dave. Hey, good evening, everyone in the group. Not much uh, activity related to project. And working on the server did an upgrade to the hypervisor and watched everything go down in flames. So, typical, typical server stuff. Back to the group. Well, uh, <laughs> that brings us to the end of the list. And so we're open for general discussion. I did watch, go out and take some pictures of the uh, conjunction of uh, Jupiter and Saturn tonight. So. Uh, that was visible by eye for me. Can you uh, show show the picture? Uh, I I went out and looked at it. I could see it using binoculars, but do you have uh, any pictures you can show? Yeah, yeah, no, I don't have it downloaded. It was on my good camera. Totally clouded out here in New Hampshire, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to rely on others. Yeah, same here in uh, Pennsylvania. I I had a good view of it from here, but it. It only was about an hour before it went below the horizon. So that's same here. Yeah, that's that's very low. So, but I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> Nathaniel, how much snow did you get? About fourteen inches. Okay, I got eighteen, but twenty miles from me, they got forty-eight. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of. They snow. had pe lots of people with three to four feet of snow on that. I, last I keep trying to convince Rachel that we need to buy a snowmobile. <laughs> How about Aurora? Have you guys ever seen Aurora uh, recently when the storm hit? The, the, uh, fellow, the guy from Alberta, uh, he. He uh, was saying Martin. that Martin. Aurora's work, Martin, he was saying it was common outside his house. Yeah. Uh, we haven't seen a good Aurora this far south in quite some time. We'll see how this uh, solar cycle does us. And the CME that just went past was BZ was positive. So it just basically went by laminar flow. Didn't do much even to the, earth, the ionosphere. So, hey, Nathaniel, we could take a vote on here for your snowmobile. Would that help convince Rachel that you should buy one? Uh, probably. <laughs> or I. <laughs> I, think, I think it more comes down to, can we use it for more than three days a year? Yeah. Yeah, well. It's, it's not like Svalbard. Oh, no, I know. That was great where you could just, <laughs> where I'd drive my snowmobile to school every day. Those, those are the days. <laughs> yeah, well. I think we're going to have a snowy year. It'll be interesting to see if it pans out. Yeah. I mean, but, if it, yeah. Between El Nina and um, a lot of aerosols in the air from uh, things like the wildfires, we may be a little cooler this year and get some decent snow. Certainly mm -hmm. looking that way so far. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Nathaniel, maybe what you just need to do is get some sled dogs and a sled, and because you can play with the dogs no matter what the weather. That's true. That would be fun. <laughs> yeah, in fact, we have a sled a woman who has a sled dog team up the road here. She has a cart that she runs them with when there isn't snow. That's pretty cool. 
Yeah. Anthony would love that. They do eat all the time, whether there's snow or not. <laughs> they <do>. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they need to be pets, though. They're, this It's not just a... It's not just something you keep in a kennel. It, they, they have to be pets. Yeah. yeah. So you love them anyway, and you're happy to feed them. So become like a family. That would definitely be fun. But you might we have, have, we have lots of deer. Dog. Deer? Yeah, deer. We have lots of deer. Uh, we had in our neighbor's yard, our neighbor puts out, uh, has a feeder for them. Uh-huh. My brother-in-law went went past he lives next door and my this other other fellow on the other side has his feeder my brother-in-law counted 47 deer in the front yard of my neighbor's house uh -oh. yesterday what they do is they they come over and eat the corn in his yard and then come into, into our yard for dessert and so oh. eat every <laughs> ornamental flower and shrub oh, so no. what you have to do is you have to put uh chicken wire around everything that you want to save yeah Wow. So that's an that's unusual, Bill, for Alabama to have that many deer. My brother. Well, I, I mean, if you feed them. Oh, yeah. But Pennsylvania is known for having high deer populations. Oh, we have them by the thousands. I mean, yeah. I don't know anybody who hadn't hit hit them on the road. Both my wife and I have hit them on the road. Just. I don't I don't remember many in all the years we lived down there and we lived you know, in, fair, in fairly wooded um, you know, terrain off the, you know, so, southern Birmingham. Oh, so, South Birmingham, uh, precisely <laughs> where? McAllen? Oh, no, not that far south. I mean, in the southern suburbs, but it, I mean, in, my, in, 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 in what's it called? Mountain Brook. Yeah. Mountain but Brook. Oh, on the edge of the golf course or near the golf course. But yeah, that's we that's the high rent district. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was kind of. Yeah, but there was lots of woods and uh, my parents house was in the woods and I never saw a deer. Lots of chipmunks. My brother lives in Chesterfield and he hates the deer. They come in, like you said, Bill, and eat everything. Yeah, they, I, I dislike they start, them. They, they um, bark off of trees and they kill plants. And he's trying yeah, to find ways to, to shoo them away. So it depends a lot as to whether or not you have plants that you care about in your yard. Yes. Yeah. So if, if you don't have any plants that you care about in your yard, then the deer can be quite nice. If you yeah, care I mean, about they, your plants. If, the, if, they don't, if you don't care about the plants, the deer won't either. They'll leave them alone. It's just <laughs> some kind of Murphy, <laughs> Murphy thing going on there. Uh, I've noticed that, yeah. That reminds me of a friend of mine who lives back in Maryland, and his neighbor had horses. Mm. And the horses would <laughs> come up and strip the bark off of trees along the property line and kill them. So he ended up having to put like chicken wire around the tree trunks to the height where the horses couldn't reach. Yes. <laughs> and he, he told us, <laughs> I can't really repeat all the things that he did to this horse, but oh. you know, he and the horse had a little, um, shall we say, alpha bonding ritual that they went <laughs> <laughs> for him to explain to the horse how he wasn't supposed to be eating the tree bark. <laughs> I don't know how well, but I think the chicken wire works better. But yes, I think so. Oh my gosh! Uh, we have a resident, um, uh, a, a resident little family that, that's in our neighborhood here. Um, that kind of gets grows and gets bigger some years and gets smaller, but there's usually half a dozen to 10 that eat everything, of course. So are these deer or horses? Oh, I, I was back on deer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, at least you can ride a horse. I don't think you can ride a deer. No, they're not good for much. <laughs> Well, I spoke with um, Veronica and her father today, and we're going to uh, send them an antenna and uh, get them set up on HF. 
Oh, good. Yeah. So um, it sounds like they have a, a nice a nice uh, house plot of land out in western New Jersey as well, a few acres, and it sounds very good for some HF work. So I'm going to send them a off-center fed dipole and uh, lend her the club's IC7300 for a little while, and then we'll get a grape station out there and let her have some hands-on experience at some of these radios. That's good. Nathaniel, did is that who did you say it was? Did you say it was Veronica? Yeah, Veronica. Okay. Yeah. Has she been on the air actually since she got her license or not? I don't just, think just not really. I think maybe she got on Echo Link a little bit, but she's played around in some Kiwi SDRs, but no, not really. So we're going to fix that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, when you first get your license and haven't been on the air before, it's 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 a little bit of a Feels like a high wire act. Yes. Uh, when you first start trying to do it. Yeah. That's right. So I agree. It's a little bit intimidating for the for the newbie. Yes. Well, yeah. So, so I had a I had a Zoom with both her and her dad today, and we were able, we were going over like how where to put up the antenna, and he was like, "Yeah, th this looks all good," and they were very encouraging about it. Yeah. If you haven't. If you don't know what the procedure is, it's intimidating to get on there and try to make a QSO. I know I remember my first log books, page after page of CQs unanswered, you know, <laughs> calling people that never came back to me. And it's like, of course, I didn't have much of an antenna, but still it was, yeah. it was kind yeah. of um, discouraging. You know, so, so Nathaniel, does she know any hams in their community? I don't think she does yet, but she lives, she definitely lives close to some. Yeah, she should try to get a hold of a, a club or something nearby that can give her a little help. Yeah. They're usually more than happy to help new people. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that's fun is uh, I have, I'm set up for all bands and I'm available most of the time. She can contact me and we can set up a sked and I can talk her through some of the stuff on the air. So that'll kind of get you past the you got to get desensitized to be able to push the transmit button. You got you got to. Yeah, gotta get, you got to be willing to put the tr push the transmit button. And if you're talking to somebody, you know, or, you know, on a schedule, it makes it a, it's a little bit easier. I, I agree with that. So put her in touch with me and I will try and set up a sked once she has an antenna up. That'd be really nice. Yeah, hopefully um, yeah. soon after the soon after the new year. I don't know yeah. how how fast this all this stuff is gonna go, but yeah, I think it'll be really good. So, so does she live in Scranton or in New Jersey? She lives in New Jersey. Okay. Near Clinton, New Jersey, probably about an hour from Scranton. Yeah. So, like like Dave says, look for antennas and knock on doors or find a local club is the best thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I know my uh, my friend Pete Teklinski, who is the um, he was the club advisor at NJIT. He lives very close to them. Well, okay, there you go. Get yeah. get them introduced to each other. Yeah, they, they have they've met each other on Zoom. So, okay, yeah, everyone everyone does know each other. And I have another student, uh, Tommy Barron. Um, he's been a ham before I knew him. Uh, so I gave him the job of contacting all the other uh, universities that we could think of. And he's supposed to ask what type of antenna system they have. Can they send pictures and give them details? And he's supposed to compile that all into a, a presentation so that we can then go to our administration and say, hey, look, MIT has this and Columbia has this and Penn State has this and we should have one too. The there's a, a good ham club system across the southeast. Bill may know. Do you know the one at uh, Alabama there? The well, club? I, yeah, when, when they had their inaugural meeting in the fall, I went and went to one of their meetings and to give a presentation about the person space for the project. And there were Besides the club advisor there, there are three people there. Yeah. <laughs> and one person who was an alum. 
And I was met with a deafening silence after I gave the presentation and asked who would be interested in working on this. Yeah. And so the club, you know, Alabama is not really known as a yeah. school where you go if you're interested in tech and all that stuff. It's much more of a party school. Uh, so, uh, well, I I was the advisor for the Missouri club for several years, and actually, they helped me get my novice license years ago. Hmm. But um, there was a guy at the University of Tennessee that was uh, he was a doctor, an MD doctor. And somehow he had wrangled a room that was under the bleachers of the stadium. And the stadium for Tennessee is downtown. So, <laughs> but it, it, then their antenna was up on some of the scaffolding up above the stadium. So, <laughs> but he was actively trying to recruit all the uh, SEC schools to, uh, uh, kind of collaborate and the SEC schools used to have a um, uh, a, not really a contest they just tried to all make a contact on was the first weekend in December which was like the last regular game of the year in the SEC conference by the old scheduling yeah (laughs) and so uh, they tried to get all the ham clubs to at least contact each other. And I don't know. But... Hmm. So there are those kinds of things going on, too. Yeah. There, there is... yeah. Are you looking for other radio station pictures and, and gear and outfits to add to your presentation? Uh, as long as they're from universities, yeah. Okay. I got one for you. You'll never, this is a pretty awesome one. So uh, it's the school I went to. This is W2SZ. Uh huh. They have that's, their own their own building. That's RPI, right? RPI, oh. yeah. <clears throat> and this is actually a huge upgrade from when I was there because they had an old Army Quonset hut when I was there. Oh and, wow! And <clears throat> it leaked air like crazy. So what you did is. There's no point in turning the heat on ahead of time because more heat went out through the cracks in the building than actually <laughs> came out of the furnace. So, so you know, made sure to wear heavy clothes when you went up in there. So this is much nicer than uh, the original one. And this, the view from their radio shack is there. Wow. Leave that because it's the Hudson River is down here. And, and what you don't see, the, actually, this doesn't look right because I don't know what that is. But the view is similar because it looks out over the Hudson Valley. And what you don't see is behind you is a hill, the steep hill up where the water tower for Troy is. And their antenna towers are where the water tower is. So the antenna towers are in the highest point in the town for miles. And um, I know when I was there, these guys, they built a uh, eight element 15 meter beam. Wow. Now you can imagine how big the boom was. I think it was a three-inch boom. All Scotty, I can see the view that they they say it right there. It's from Mount Greylock. That's Greylock. Okay, because they have an ex- ex- expeditionary trip every year in the VHF contest to try and beat everyone else out. So I guess I don't have a view from the. Yeah, because that's a giveaway here. This this there's no road like this in front of the radio station. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, so what they did is they put up this uh, eight element, 15 meter beam. Now it's fed with one inch hard line about 300 feet up the hill at the highest point on, on a tower. And this was in uh, 1976, I don't know, 1974, 73, 74. So it was a good uh, sunspot cycle was just past its peak and starting to wind down. But they got such a good signal into the into the Far East, they started handing serial numbers out. And the Japanese guys heard about serial numbers. They thought it was a contest. And they, they ran like three or 400 JAs off the 15-meter beam. They, they called it Jap cars because, you know, for East cars and West cars, they had Jap cars. Because these guys were really, they were learning Japanese and they wanted to use their language and they wanted to talk to as many Japanese stations as they could. 
So it was amazing that they built this beam and put it up and did all that. I can tell you how, the, however, though, it did not survive the winter. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the next year it became like a, uh, a five element 15 meter beam. <laughs> <because> <laughs> the boom broke and they had oh, no. to redo it. <laughs> but anyway, it was uh, fond memories. This is, this is actually down here. This is more like what it was inside. I don't know. This is the funny thing is here. W2 AAU, Dick Fry. He was he graduated right before I did, so he was hanging around the radio shack all the time I was there. And you, but this is a horrible picture. He's, he's up here; you can't hardly see him. Wow. But these guys were um, infamous, or shall I say, they were loved or hated, depending on whose side you're on. But they developed the term "captive rover" because they had guys building stuff all year long, and they would go out and they would talk only to W2SZ in the VHF contest. So they get all these multipliers from on you know 1296 or something because they have a guy that went out to the county over there and he put up a big antenna, talked just to them, and then took down and went to the next place. So they got in a lot of heat for that because <laughs> uh, um, you know saying oh you guys are cheating because you get all these rover contacts that nobody else can get because they won't talk to us. <laughs> oh gee, so. <laughs> I never really was uh, involved in the gray log. I mean, I heard it going on while I was there, but it was uh, that long hair VHF stuff and I was into HF, so I didn't pay much attention. Hmm. But they had cool. some good gear back then. They had a Drake line and a 2K3 amplifier mm -hmm. in the main station. And then yeah. they had a, in the, the poor man station, which was, uh, it was a 32V3 and uh HT37, no, HT37 was the transmitter. I forget, I think it was maybe a 75A1 was the receiver. So even it was no slouch, but it was not a transceiver. So yeah. it was the, the, and then one of the friends of um, the guy who was there at W2AAU, W2AAU, he brought a Signal 1, he, his own personal Signal 1 into the shack. Now, remember, this was like 1973 three or 74 mm -hmm. that was like a five thousand dollar radio back in the 1970s wow so it was a really high-end radio and he was really proud of that and he brought it in to use it in the dx contest because of the antennas that Zed had he could connect up to those hmm. and i still remember uh spoofing him because <laughs> me and a friend of mine were really kind of irritated because this guy was kind of egotistical so uh, we, we went in the other room, we turned the Drake line on, we turned the power all the way down mm -hmm. and, and put it on a dummy load. And then we would call him, <laughs> we'd call him with phony call signs. And <laughs> so, so we, we, we got a call book out. We looked up, it was, I think it was Bahrain. We had two hams, right? Mm -hmm. we made up a Bahrain call sign and we would call him <laughs> Bahrain call sign in the DX contest. Now like that would never happen, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then we heard him, just throw something big and heavy and start swearing and stomping around in the other room. So we took quick turned everything off and went and sat down in the in the lounge and waited to see what he would do. <laughs> but he'd get he'd get on there and he's, he was swearing at the bootleggers who were continually harassing him. Because he, he <laughs> when we call him, he just QSY. Huh. And then we we'd QSY with him and call him again. So now you know that's not gonna happen. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so we did have well, our fun, you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, the one thing I was going to tell you, Nathaniel, keeping a club going is hard. Yeah. I mean, from a faculty point of view. Yeah. Because the university, at least in our u university, uh, student clubs are student clubs. Now, right. you're an advisor, but you can't keep the club going in between students. And having a continuous chain of students is a hard thing to maintain. Yeah, that's going to be a, a challenge. Well, but yeah, that's... we have that experience at Dartmouth. We're officially a club, but uh, it's hard to keep students. Uh, yeah, and there's the... usually ten or fifteen or more uh, faculty. There maybe were in the club when they were a student, but but they're more than willing to help. But uh, it's hard to get a hybrid club going. The university doesn't really go encourage that. Mm -hmm. Well, at ASU, I know it's been through it since I've been here. 
which is a long time actually. It's been through at least three iterations where it goes down to zero, mm-hmm. and, and they lose their room, and they take all the antennas down, they sell everything off, and then there's no radio club. And then they, if they get a, a group of students together that has enough interest, then they get it started again and go buy the gear. And I still remember this one guy. He bought an S line at the ASU surplus equipment store because they liquidated the ham club and they had an S line and he got, <laughs> got it for like $200 yeah. because he didn't know what it was. And they just put it up on the block for sale for, to, you know, get rid of that stuff. Wow. And so it went, it goes around and around, up and down, up and down. So, yep. Well, I think our, our club is kind of co- going to be co-sponsored by the department of physics and engineering with me and also, and then also through the, um, student organization. So that should give it a little bit more stability, I think. Yeah. Well, especially and, if you've got a professor who's the like you who is there all the time. Yeah, and it's actually written into my career proposal that I'm going to make the ham radio <laughs> work. So that kind of motivates things. A bit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Our club, we've got a lot, of, a lot of alumni in it. And and I can include, I have to have a service component for my tenure dossier and creating a ham radio club counts as service. All right. Oh <laughs> so, um, but so Nathaniel, you... were you asking for uh, pictures of yes. radio clubs? Yes. Um, ours is over in the engineering school mm-hmm. and uh, was recently um, reconstituted we actually got a whole bunch of our antennas kicked off the roof of the engineering school. They, cause they said, we don't do radio here. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> they don't teach RF in engineering Somebody school didn't very much like anymore. the view. We put on a new addition, which uh-huh. had a balcony and somebody uh-huh. didn't like the view being marred by antennas. Yeah, I keep hearing this. Jim Brakel had a very similar discussion with me. And, uh, but we did get our um, closet back and we do have some antennas. And um, unfortunately we don't have a lot of uh, student support, but we do have a club. Um, uh, we have a great call sign too. We want to keep it W1ET. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is a really good call sign. Jonathan Rizzo, how are we going to keep our club going? Is Jonathan there? So, Nathaniel, I was wondering how soon do you need a picture if it? Um, oh, within a couple weeks. Okay. Because I don't get over to the Thayer School. Um, you know, I'm, of course, over at physics, but uh, I can get Eric Hansen perhaps to take a picture for us. That'd be great. And uh, Nathaniel, uh, there is a picture of the University of Alabama club station on their qrz.com uh, web page. And I'm sure that they would be happy to have you use it. Uh, so I was going to say, uh, I know Alabama does some, at least create some technical people. Um, Scott Bounds, who's at Iowa, and we do uh, sounding rockets with him. Uh, he's went to Alabama. Yeah. And- Club. They got a pretty good setup, don't they, Nathaniel? Yes, we are definitely contacting Cases Club. I think I gave on the list so far, I gave him like um, Case Western, uh, Penn State. Um, there, there's a whole bunch. NJIT's needs, their antenna needs to be redone. So I don't think I included that one. But the if you go, if you look up W4UAL, you will find on QRZ, you will find the uh, lot. There's a lot of photos. You got to scroll all the way to the bottom to see a picture of the UA club, uh, club station. They don't include any pictures of their antennas, but there are antennas up on top of one of the university buildings. But you can see a picture of the shack anyway. If you there it is. Use that. For yeah. That's very nice. Yeah, did you know how the term shack came to be? No. I was just reading this, reading a book on old wireless uh, radio, 
that uh, the first radio station set up by the Marconi company on board a ship for testing was mm-hmm. literally a shack pitched on the deck of a ship. Huh. And the radio gear was installed there to do the testing. And so that kind of caught on and it became the radio shack from then on. That's really cool. This looks like a field day setup. Is that? Yeah, I think WUAL has been known to operate field day from the quad, which is the big place in front of the the library and Denny Chimes is there and stuff. Uh, I have not participated with them because I've usually participated with the uh, Tuscaloosa Amateur Radio Club rather than the UA Club. Because the Tuscaloosa Amateur Radio Club has a lot more members <laughs> than the UA Radio Club. But sometimes people from the UA Radio Club will come to the TARC uh, ham rather that a field day and work a radio or two. So. Cool. Pretty cool, yes. So anyway, if, you, if you'd like to use that for something, it's there. Thank you. I will let um, Tommy know. I think the other thing I need to do over here is I need to um, I really need to get another antenna up on my property here because right now I've just been using my one antenna just for the chirp sounder. Um, so it's just been on a receive only mode, which it's it's been running nicely for about seven days now, which is really good. But um, it'd be nice to be able to use the antenna for some other things too. Dave, what was the magnetometer station that you just mentioned? I actually I missed the earlier part when you mentioned Noah uh, Dolores Nips. Uh, they set one up in Columbia, Missouri, but it oh, Missouri. Okay, they, okay. Um, Jennifer is, uh, you know, wor- had worked on some of the uh, power line projects, you know, because they get power surges when they're uh, magnetic events. And there's a section of the United States that's kind of from Missouri to Scotty in the Southwest that have no magnetometers. And because we have one in Boulder or we have Fredericksburg and there's nothing between between the two. Until now. Till now. And Dolores grew up in Missouri, and her father has a farm somewhere near between here and Kansas City. And uh, I think she was trying to put one on that her father's farm as well. <laughs> but uh, but see. they put one at here in Columbia at uh, a site that's maintained by the Atmospheric Science Department. Okay. So uh, I, Dave Witten has been out there, but um, it, it's a little bit remote. So I don't know if they actually have a wire or just a Wi-Fi running from the station back to the farm buildings. I think it's just Wi-Fi. They, they must have power to it and they must have you know they run something out there wherever it is what they use normally is a commercial weather station um, and they set those up and the system they have across the state uh, they usually set them up next to a school like an elementary school and then they use it in their teaching science and then they hook on the Wi-Fi that the school has. So, but uh, they were planning this last year. Uh, I met with Dolores before COVID became a thing 
and uh, she was interested in collaborating. And then all of the COVID stuff kind of put us all on hold. Now, I don't know what they're going to do with the data exactly, but I asked for permission to access some of the data. I don't know if they're going to publish it or if they're just going to uh, use it for their research project. I mean, if that's, really, that's, that's associated with NOAA, then I believe the data should be public. I know. Jennifer has a company, private company, who runs yes. uh, uh, for space weather monitoring, whatever. I don't really know what yes. she does, but. Well, Jennifer is the PI of the project. So if that's the private company's property, then maybe the data may not be public. Then. No, the, the property block where the put the magnetometer is a university property. Oh, OK, OK. It's, yeah, but even if even if it's on university property, the magnetometer itself could be on a grant that's to her uh, private company. It could be, but I've been contact. Uh, I had met Dolores in the past. Uh, she spent some time here a year back. Oh, twelve years ago. Uh, she was in our department for a year. And so I got to know who she was. And she actually was a good friend of my uh, brother-in-law who uh, worked for no, uh, the Severe Storms Lab in Norman and is retired now. So. Yeah, I'm actually, I see their, their grant. They have a DAISY grant as well. So they have a DAISY track too. So. Would that indicate that it's private or that they would make the data public? Um, well, it looks like it's to her company, Company Physics Incorporated. And there's, there she is. Here's the abstract. Well, Dolores is, is interested in, uh, you know, so she's been encouraging me. Yeah. I think there's a good chance they'll share the data. Well, even if they'll just let well, us calibrate against it. That's the main thing that I was thinking was calibrating against so that our numbers come out. Some I'm I'm almost sure. Like, I can't see any good reason why they would not do that. I Is, think that's uh, NSF very, like NASA, where you have to share your data? Uh, I'm um, not sure. I know. Certainly true of w USGS and everybody else. I, like I think. Yeah. I think the rule. I think you get a certain amount of time to keep the data to yourself to get something published ah. I, I think after you you do have to have like some plan for releasing the data well and i only asked for the columbia site right that's, i didn't ask for their whole data set yeah and and that's that's a very reasonable request so that's an extremely reasonable request and for doing things like checking against our magnetometers that's also reasonable Right. And usually data providers, like they will be very reasonable about it too. If you like, sometimes you need to make them a co-author or you just have to acknowledge it properly. Right. right. So, so as long as, as long as you work with the PI and follow the, the rules, it'll be right. Fine. So I think they have every good reason to be cooperative. They get, they probably get points, brownie points and other points for, for being collaborative too. That's a big thing now. With I, would think, I would think NSF would encourage that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I tried my report to them on our project is extremely collaborative. And if we do get this collaborative link, then you can report it on yours. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All sorts of stuff like that. Uh, 
Did you see uh, Jules was in the news this week again? No. No. Oh, uh, yeah. He, I was going through my Google uh, News, and he showed up in the news. And I learned something <clears throat> new yet again about him. Let me see if I can find it. Apparently, his boyhood home in Clark, New Jersey, is being demolished. And they're replacing it with... Um, it's already demolished. Yeah, it's already demolished. Yeah, so this is the article that popped up. I put it in the chat. There. Right, so yeah, two kids, a ham radio, and the world at their fingertips. How the Maddie brothers made history in Clark. And they go on to talk about them. And apparently, um, you know, they, they, were, they became famous for their work um, communicating with Antarctica at the beginning of the Antarctic program. And uh, Jules's brother, uh, John Matty, it said he he invented the free electron laser, and later became a professor at the University of Hawaii. And it also oh, wow. says that Jules invented Easy Pass. Huh. Was, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, that's why he knows a lot about um, keeping noise out of. Um, out of sensors because he's he created he, the easy pass it was really hard to keep the um the the cops radios and the semis you know cbs and things from messing it up <laughs> so other than Dave and I and Jules, is anybody else set up their magnetometer and have it working yet? Um, I haven't got mine yet, but I'm working on it. I need okay. to have a, um, you know, if you're going to get continuous data, I'm going to have to have a, its own uh, processor for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm running mine off my Odroid, and I think Dave and Jules are both running them off a Raspberry Pi 4. Yeah, well, I've got some um, straight Raspberry Pi 2s. I don't know if that will run on uh, that. If any of you do set Should. one up, I'd like to at least know, you know, the, the individuals that are collecting data to start doing data analysis. And, and then Dave's going to start uh, collecting our data. <laughs> I, I was kind of uh, concerned because my my data for the the axes is very flat, but when I looked at um, the Fredericksburg site, it's flat too. <laughs> <laughs> so and that's what Jules has been saying too. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we and, haven't had a whole lot of activity down this far south. Yeah. Anyway, there's been a lot of activity up way up north. But, but not down this far. And I don't know, I found a, a site, I was, I don't know where there's uh, stacked uh, sites and they're by continent. And um, I think it's uh, space weather, it's got another word in there. I have, to, I have a link to it somewhere. Oh, let's see. By stacked, you mean um, multiple sites on a common yeah. graph? Yes. Yeah, there's a um, Greenland chain, there's a Norway chain, um, and there's a Canada chain that you can get yes. access to. Canada chain's useful for us, of course, because if it gets down to St. John's, it's getting close to us here in New Hampshire. Uh, 
uh, here, spaceweatherlive.com. If you roll down, there's a stack for Europe and a, stack, and a Canadian one, and then a stack for North America. And uh, <coughs> FRD is Fredericksburg. And mm -hmm. there's a boulder in there somewhere too. And then you can also, uh, if you go to more data, you get the USGS plot by station. And it's geomags.usgs.gov plots. Do you want me to put either of those links in or do most everybody aware of those? The spaceweatherlive.com website is very nice. Yes, I like that as a way to just figure out, is there any activity going on? Yeah, I've usually been going to spaceweather.com, but this has perhaps a little more information. I don't know. I'm running on a browser or a, a copy of Zoom on Linux, and it doesn't let me paste in, <laughs> in the <laughs> chat, hmm. so. Uh, yes, the, the European one have uh, Trumps and Andoya on it. Yeah. Andoya is where I've been uh, flying rockets. Well, that's good. They just had a nice uh, display, it looks like. Yes, I yeah, saw right. that. Right around zero UT. Yeah. Yeah. This, actually most people here probably don't know how to interpret this. Right. So yeah, this is the European stack plot. And oh, that's long European. There's Neallison, Neallison, yeah. Arnson, Hoopin, Bjornaya. Um, and, and so this is the H, the horizontal component. And so basically when you see this, you're seeing um, large electric currents uh, going overhead. And this is pretty consistent with what you'd expect to see in something called an auroral substorm. Yep. So right well, if you look at North America, about more than half of the stations are basically flat. You can also see that it's strongest right around here. Yeah. So that's where it, this is organized by latitude. So the highest latitude nice. stations are going to be up here and your lowest latitude stations are going to be down here. And, and then X is time. time. Yeah, yeah, this is time in, in UTC. And so you know that the um, substorm or that the uh, overall electrojet is, going, is strongest right around here. And it's weaker as you go farther north and then weaker as you go equatorward. Yep. It would be cool if we could figure out how to make a graph like that for our stations. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the trick with us is that most of our stations are going to be in the continental United States. Yes. And you're going to be too, too equatorward to see these types of signatures on a regular basis. So you need to recruit a couple of uh, Canadians. Northern Canadian and mm -hmm. uh, Alaska people to get yeah. a personal space weather. Right. I think there are Canadians and Alaskans who are interested. But in the middle latitude, you'll see some dayside uh, phenomena, such as compression of the magnetosphere, then you'll see the increase, huge increase in mm -hmm. H component yep. of magnetometer. So that's, that's going to be interesting too. Nathaniel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm interested. Once you start rolling them out, I'm interested in buying one. That'd be great, Greg. Yeah, so. And where in Canada are you? I'm um, 
So to make it relative for you guys, I'm two hours uh, east of Detroit City in, in Ontario. Okay. So roughly. L London, Ontario. Okay. Oh, I know where that is. Not too far from Mike. He's north of Detroit. I'm and... across the river from Sarnia. Oh, Port Huron. Okay. Yep. You got it. <laughs> Most area in Canada is good in terms of space weather monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> no, but when, once you start rolling them out, I'm uh, very interested. So. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. You're welcome. Well, we might, we will be distributing more ground magnetometers in the near future. Cool. So. <clears throat> Well, Nathaniel, I'm going to have to go. Uh, and I think my I might as well. Time limit, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think that sounds like a good plan. This has been fun. Uh, we had enjoyed it this evening. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Uh, Happy holidays, holidays, everyone. Merry, 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 Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy, Happy conjunction. Christmas. <laughs> yeah, happy conjunction. <laughs> happy conjunction. Very Yes. So I guess we'll see. Yes. We will have one of these next week, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. I, I will be out. You'll be out. Okay. I'll, I'm, tr I'm on the road. I'll be here. I'll, I'll be road. around. I'm not <laughs> going anywhere. Be, I guess I've we'll got a lot of distractions. Yeah. Wonderful. So Merry I will. Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Christmas Merry to Christmas. you all. See you, bye. Week, bye. Seven three. Seven three. So Dan, you still there? Yes, I have to uh, put my headset back on and turn on the microphone. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. Got you loud and clear. Okay, let me change my uh, reception over to the uh, headset here. Remember how to do that. Audio output, Logitech USB headset. There we go. Okay, I think I'm on the air now. All right. Well, I'm not going to last very long here, but just wanted to say hello. No, that's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, I finally got around to sending that damn thing on Wednesday and I went to actually went to the post office on Monday. There were 63 people in line and Holy two clerks. Jeez, but could, could so you I went back. Yeah, go ahead. So I went back on Tuesday and there were 41 people in line, but only one clerk. <laughs> so even worse. <laughs> Well, couldn't you yeah, so I actually, half time and then just dump it off? Uh, no, because the machine that they have that allows you to buy postage was shut down for wow. whatever reason. See, it's interesting because it was in op. In uh, what Nona uses, Nona uses stamps.com. And since yeah. stamps.com is electronically traceable postage, you can put it on a package and you can just dump the package in the bin and they'll take it. Sure, if sure. It weighs above a certain weight. You can't do that. You have to hand it to somebody. Yeah, it's 13 ounces is the maximum weight. Actually, I think this probably would have made it underneath the weight, but I couldn't buy postage for it. So I finally found like a private, well, not really private, but like a contract post office. Yeah. And I went in there at like eight o'clock in the morning. And they were able to take it right away. So I only had to stand in line for wait for one person. Holy so anyway, it, it, in, it got in the mail. On. Yeah. I know. That's ridiculous. So it's Christmas time, right? So everybody's mailing stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean everybody was mailing Christmas presents. No question. Oh, my. So that was that was it. Did you see the uh, message that James put on here about Michelle? 
Yes, uh, Mike actually wrote so it earlier this week. And, and, uh, oh, okay. He says, is that the same Michelle right, you yeah. know? And I said, yep, it sure is. I'll have to, I'll we have to some, uh, take a look at that. We have some uh, spots. Well, she has a spot anyway reserved. I haven't answered the guy from Hamcation, but she's all fired up to do um, – multiple technical talks at Hamcation. And I've just been so, haven't even felt like engaging her at this point. I haven't felt like yeah. anyone. <laughs> so well, <laughs> I'm just, oh, I, dear. I just lay around is about all I can manage to do. This was, this is the most. So I've you're right. In you, a week. You, have you had like the flu or cold or something? Oh, good COVID. Oh, really? Yeah, Nona tested positive on Monday, a week ago Monday. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, I, of course, I'm going to get it because I live here, so. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so. Yeah, travels in twos. Yep, so we're trying to power it out, but it's, I think I'm doing better than her, but it, it's just like it keeps hanging on. It's like when you think you're yeah. old, then it comes back, and it's like I, I get a, a low-grade temperature, about every two days, and then it goes away. Uh huh. And the cough now is almost all gone. It was bad for about three yeah. days. It's almost all gone. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but the 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 fever thing is really uh, worrisome. And Nona's the same way. Yeah. She, every couple of days, she's she's had it longer than I have. And every couple of days, she gets a fever, and then I give her a Tylenol. Yeah. We knock the fever down, and then she feels better. And then another yeah. day goes by, and then, and you know, it's long enough in between episodes that it's, I mean, the Tylenol only lasts like four to six hours. Right. So if you got a, a fever and it knocks it down, it's going to come back if it's still there, and it doesn't come back. But then a day later, it's back again. So Damn. I don't know what the hell is going on. And, but it, the fever never really goes above about 100.1. It's not really too bad. Yeah. But it's enough to make you feel awful. It's just not enough yeah, yeah. to be life oh, geez. And so I don't, you know, we can go to the doctor, but she went in and had the COVID test and came back positive. But she doesn't. I mean, there's nothing that they can do for her unless she sure. gets some respiratory distress or something. Yeah. <clears throat> so far, none of it has moved to our chest, our lungs. The doctor yeah. looked at yeah. her lungs and they were clear. So, but this quarantine inside crap is about enough i've had enough of this it's like oh yeah it's uh it's nasty yeah because i don't even, way to live your life yeah and i mean you know i thought it was bad before but but even going out to eat a couple three times a week is much nicer than going out to eat none of the times a week <laughs> yes so what are you doing for groceries having stuff delivered well, we, we stocked up pretty good for the first epidemic for, for you know way back and when yeah and then we really didn't use a lot of it because we were we were eating out so we've been using that and then yeah. Nona's son came over and bought groceries for us the other day and dropped them off on the porch yeah. so oh good that's somebody good. helping us get through it and we're then, the first person i've known that actually had covid yeah well it's not much fun so. But, you know, I can, yeah, say, I can imagine I've had the flu that was worse than this, but I'm not done with this yet either. So, yeah, that's right. And I heard that the thing is, the problem is, is the complications that apply or that occur afterwards. So, yeah, I'm not really willing to because it says 10 days after the onset of symptoms, you're clear. Well, yeah. it's, been, it's been 10 days for Nona. She's I think, let's see, Monday. Uh, no, it's been eight days. So. But there's no way she's anywhere near clear. I mean, she doesn't even want to go outside. I mean, she's she's still yeah. feeling bad. So I thought maybe it would be 10 days after the last symptoms, but that's not what the doctor said. Right. Yeah, it supposedly has a life cycle of about 10 days. But, you know, that's really determined by how effectively your body fights it, too. Yeah. So neither one just, of us are young. No, just don't know. Yeah, yeah so. that's right. Well, I got my uh, pneumonia shot last week. 
Okay. So that was like my accomplishment for the week. <laughs> so how soon so, are you going to get a COVID shot? Uh, as soon as I can. I'm not sure when that's going to be. So you, I'm assuming it's going to be right, right around the first of the year. Oh, okay. I thought you were thinking more the end of January. I was thinking that, but I think it's going to happen a little quicker. Okay. Well, that's good because I think it's it's going to be a little slower out here. Because yeah. I don't well, you don't have to worry about it now. I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it let, so yeah, let, you saved so yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah know. that's right. <laughs> well, either way, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Either way, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Nona is saying, you know, I, she says, I want something to be over this. And I said, well, the only sure method I know is strychnine. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, that'll get you over it, but the uh, the uh, side effects are pretty severe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you probably don't oh, want to hear that, but it's like, oh, man. Anyway, yeah. so uh, I've got a new book I'm reading to pass the time when my head doesn't hurt. Yeah. And it's called the what is it? The Wake of the Wireless Men. The Wake of the Wireless oh. Man. And it's a story about a guy who was um, uh, joined up the wireless service with Marconi in 1914. And uh -huh. it's, it was written by his uh, wife or his, I think his sister, maybe. And anyway, it's a uh -huh. story about this guy, uh, Dale. Uh, What's his name? Uh, anyway, his first name's Dale. So he uh, this is very interesting because it talks about the first days of wireless, and you know he he uh, he wanted to get on board and, and do radio from the very beginning. Uh huh. And so yeah, his um, and his dad was opposed to it. He wanted him to finish high school. He wasn't a very good high school student, so. He proposed uh -huh. to, when, when uh, the guy in Valparaiso, Indiana, opened up his wireless school for um, uh, shipboard operators. He had a uh -huh. he had a wireless school for radio for uh, a railroad guys. But then when the mm -hmm. wireless came uh, around, he decided to open up a school for wireless operators for shipboard. And so mm -hmm. uh, Dale signed up for that. Got his dad to agree that if he would do that and go out on the merchant uh, circuit for a couple of years and come back and finish high school, his dad would agree to fund him to get him the, the train fare and the tuition and all that for the school. And, uh -huh. and so right now um, he did that. He went out in 1914, got his got went through the school, got his license, went out, shipped out all over. And then he came back home to finish his high school diploma tried to get into the local community college or local college without some of the requirements that he needed because he uh, didn't complete them. Anyway, right. he talked them into letting them into to the degree program in the school and then World War I breaks out. Oh. So, <laughs> so, so he, he quits high school and goes and signs up uh, to, to sign on a freighter for World War I. The freighter sailing out of... Oh my of, gosh. Let's see, where's he sailing out of? Uh, uh, I want to say the East Coast somewhere, but because he wants he he signed up, he, he wrote a, a sent a telegraph telegram to the Marconi Company and said he wanted to be assigned to the War Theater. Well, World War One, the only theater was Europe, right? Right. So he would have to be sailing in the Atlantic. And in fact, it was because yeah. his destination was Italy. He was going to sail to Italy. Yeah. Because wasn't Italy our ally in World War One? Uh, yes, I believe they were. Yeah. So unlike World War Two, where they were our adversary until we right. them, and then yeah. they reluctantly became our ally in the end. Right. Anyways, I've got to, duress, just to the I point. Guess. I've got just to the point where he signed on to the uh, freighter. That he's going to be. Oh wow! He's going to be on for the duration for well for the for the war, but we weren't in the war huh. that long. This is uh, let's see, he's in uh, he's in summer of nineteen seventeen, I want to say, because the war was over by November. 18th, yeah, it, right. Right. It, it lasted about a year and a half, I think. Yeah, for us. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so there was actually a guy from where I grew up that did about the exactly the same thing, except he didn't go to sea. He was like just on land. He was like an early amateur radio operator in the 19 teens. His name was Mike Butcher. Was he a coast station operator? No, he wasn't. He, um, he actually ended up, you know, he was obviously proficient at code. And he ended up being an instructor in the army oh. for World War One. And uh, then he, I don't know, I, I ran into him. I was on the air one day when at W8LT at, at Ohio State, and I was talking to a guy in Tampa who was a fireman. And I meant I, I knew that this guy lived in Tampa. My the guy that, that came from the town I came from. And I said, do you know this guy? And he says, yeah. He said, he has a shop right across the street from the fire station. So <laughs> he yeah. ran over across the street and got him <laughs> and brought him back. <laughs> his his, wow. his uh, shack was at the fire station. They had like a ham radio station at the fire station. So, so it was reason. a radio shack. That, so he was a radio guy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So he came over and I, I talked to him for a while. And uh, I mean, I knew his name, but I didn't really know him very well. And he was, I think he was adopted and his adopted brother actually lived right across the road from us. And, did he grow, uh, he grew anyway, up, so. Did he grew up near you then? Yeah, he grew up in the same town. It was a town of like 800 people. Right, this is but life, he was right? long gone by the time I was around. Yeah. Oh, so you just knew of him. Yeah, right? yeah I knew of him. I knew of him because of, uh, it's a weird story. I, so I'll skip the whole thing, but it was, <laughs> then I ultimately met him. He came to visit his, you know, foster brother. And uh, we all went to an Ohio state football game one Saturday. This is probably mm -hmm. about 1970, <laughs> 68 or 70, something like that. And uh, so I was going to school. So anyway, Oh, yeah, it's kind of a long, long story. Mike Butcher. I hadn't thought about him for years. Oh, but yeah. he's long well, since gone. I mean, he he would have been, you know, 140 years old by now. <laughs> Speaking of that, do you remember a guy from DCC named Mike Hightower? I do remember him. Yes, I was in the Red Devil the other night, and he was there with his family across a table a couple of rows down. It's from San Diego, right? Yeah. And he was, he has family here. Yeah. He was visiting here and he was eating at the Red Devil. I'll be damned. I'll be damned. I remember just, him. Yeah. He made that little, made that little radio called the Simple SDR. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking to him about maybe having Tapper build it. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I've, I've got one. He gave me one and I've still got it around here somewhere. All right. Never did it wasn't much of a radio. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't very good at all. <laughs> but it was cool. It was one of the, I mean, it was little and it was, you know, for what it was, it was okay. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of like the uh, Hermes Light, you know, when they offered that to us. To it was the Hermes Extremely Light. Yeah. Extremely <laughs> Light. But the Hermes Light, by the time you're done, it's about 350 bucks. It's a couple different pieces yeah. of boards. You got to source a bunch of yep. parts, and I'm just going like, it's just another SDR, you know, for three and a half. Three yeah. And a half. Well, the, well, the simple SDR was just a receiver, but it yeah. was like I don't know. I think it was selling them for like a hundred bucks or whatever. Well, Hermes Light. So they cost them about thirty bucks. Yeah, Hermes Light was a transceiver, right? Is a transceiver. Is a transceiver. Yes, yes, it is. But anyway, I just felt that it was. For the performance that you got, it wasn't really worth the money because yeah. if it was a hundred dollar receiver or a transceiver, then it'd be worth it. But yes. when you start, yeah. push, you start getting up to the three to four hundred dollar range, yeah, you know, it's like I think you could do better, like, yeah. like what we're gonna do. Although I suspect that by the yeah. time you're done, our radio is gonna be six hundred bucks. Because oh yeah, to, yeah, without what, question. You get about, I mean, no piece will be expensive, but you're going to have to have several right. to get going. Yeah. So, yep. So, Mike uh, Hightower 
lived in uh, Rancho Bernardo, I think it was, or at least his office was there. Okay. Did, did, is he still doing the same thing at the same place? I think so. Yeah. He didn't indicate anything different. And that's, you know, I'll be darn. And an old girlfriend years ago that lived, her grandparents lived in Rancho Bernardo. Yeah. So I'm familiar with the area. Yeah, I have a, I have a cousin that lives there. Yeah. And I used to go there a lot. Nice area. Back when they were just built. Yeah. I really liked it when they were just building it. Yeah. It was that, really nice because there was just the Rancho Bernardo Inn and not a lot of other stuff around there. Now it's all so what packed was with it, houses I, and shit. I visited it about 19. Oh, that, uh, I used to go there probably from about 83 through 87, 88, something like that. Because yeah. I remember when I went there in 80, it was 80 or 81. Anyway, it was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was really not. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh. So did you stay at the hotel there, the Rancho Bernardo Inn? No, no, I stayed with their grandparents when we when I went out. To oh, visit. okay. Oh, okay. They had a really nice, you yeah. know, uh, Spanish style ranch house, and uh, yeah, a lot of empty lots and a lot of empty, you know, not no roads because yes. they were building it. Right. No, it was really quite the place, and then. Yeah, I, I hadn't gone there for about a year, maybe two. This was like back in the late 80s. And then I went back and then all of a sudden there were like 5,000 houses. <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. That's like Queen Creek where it's Jonathan like, lives. Yeah. The whole place yeah. was desert when I lived there. And now it's like just That's right. <laughs> wall to wall houses. I mean, literally, like you said, 5,000 houses. And I think you're being conservative. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yep. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, I was there at the Rancho Bernardo Inn one night, and in walks uh, Tom and Dickie Smothers. No shit. Yeah, they were coming back from being out someplace, and uh, (laughs) they had a they had a piano. Okay. They had a piano in the lobby, and uh, the hotel off to one side, and it had a lock on it, and uh, Tommy came in and. Ripped the lock off the piano, (laughs) opened it up, and started playing. (laughs) (laughs) It was funny as hell. Oh, yeah. Those guys uh, didn't believe in rules much. No, no, not at all. In fact, I read the story about how they got canceled. Yeah, it was quite an interesting... Well, yes. you remember that they had the guy on there. It, and he... it really was a good show, though. I mean, it, I mean, other than the, I mean, the only downside of it was it was a little political. It offended but, everyone. Uh, so that's when... why. I mean, sure, know. that's right. They were equal, equal opportunity offenders. I called them. <laughs> they, yeah, but they had a guy there that they hired um, a comedian to do a stand-up religious uh, spoof. Right. Oh, yes, that's right. He, yes, he came in and he did one, and it, they just got ripped for that. I mean, they got, yes, yes. What was it? Uh, N- NBC, yeah, they <laughs> but NBC just about canceled them over that. And they told him point blank, straight out, they told uh, uh, Dick, don't do this again, you will not do yeah. this again, or you will be canceled. So, what does he do? Goes out and hires the guy again to do an even more off the wall one. And oh, yeah, yeah. And by that, yeah, they were they never backed down, and then never. <laughs> and by that time, they were on a I don't know if you knew this, but they were on a um, a uh, censorship level. Okay, so in other words, they had to tape their show, and they had to send it in yeah. to Dex and NBC and have them watch it before they were allowed to air it. Right. Because they were yes. notorious for doing you know stupid things. So they yes. they recorded this, yeah. and, and the NBC guy said, "No, you're canceled." And that, that show never aired. Of course, huh. you can see it now on the internet, but it, that was what caused them yeah. to be canceled. Yeah, and by today's standards, I mean, it was totally benign, really. Yeah, I mean, really. It was a little offensive, but it was nothing. Well, I'm, I'm nothing. Going, like some of Tom Lehrer's songs were more offensive than his. Then that, that's scary. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Of course, Tom Lehrer aimed to offend everyone also, which was... That's right. I like the, they did a song called the Merry Minuet. Remember that? Like the 
the Jews hate the Germans, the Germans uh, hate yeah. the Dutch. It was no, I don't Belgium. like anyone very much. <laughs> How about National Brotherhood Week? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Catholics hate the Protestants and the Protestants hate the Catholics and the, the such hate the Muslims and everybody hates the Jews. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Step up and shake the hand. Oh, yeah. Someone you can't stand. You can tolerate yeah, that's me. Right. <laughs> oh man. So there's something about, you know, uh, treat people who are inferior to you nice and it's it's amazing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and it, so he introduces the song. He says that well, it's National Brotherhood Week and uh as a fitting tribute, this was the week that Malcolm X was shot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like so much for brotherhood, right? Yeah, right. Oh, my. Yeah, when Malcolm X was shot, I mean, the, the word was that he was taken out by some white supremacist people, but it was actually. <laughs> other black people that killed him so that kind of got hushed up well, after, for they, a while why would they kill him if he was like on their side well yeah but he wasn't on the right side of their side <laughs> so so he wasn't extreme enough then well it, it probably was that plus it was it just was affiliated with it. there was a power struggle going on within the black muslims Oh. And he wasn't on the right side of the power struggle. It was Louis Farrakhan against Malcolm X, and obviously Louis Farrakhan won. Farrakhan's still around? Oh, yeah. I think he's still alive. I don't think he's very active. Yeah. Well, did I tell you I bought a new uh, radio? No. The What'd you T got? The TX500. The Russian TX five hundred. Oh my God! Now here, let me. I'll put a link to it in the uh, okay in the chat here. All right. Uh, it's it's HRO sells it, but it's huh. not it's not in production yet. Come on, where's the chat window? It keeps going away. So they're going to use the LTC twenty two oh eight. They do exportable part in it. How do, how do they get those if those are not exportable? <laughs> yeah, you just have to go buy them from some guy in India. I mean. Yeah, that's probably true. I guess as long as it's sold sell them. in the U.S. We could sell them to India. We just couldn't sell that's them. That's right. That's right. Anyway, it's got a uh, LTC 2208. Uh, I don't know what the mm -hmm. transmitter is, whether it's a 9744 or not. But it looks like a pretty interesting radio. It's made out of like three clamshells of uh, aluminum. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 watt radio, 10 watt or 20 watt. 110 milliamps of current consumption and receive, which is pretty amazing. Uh, let's hmm. see, say how many watts it is. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, here's a transmitter. 10 watts. One to huh. 10 watts. But the thing is interesting, no ATU, no internal battery. But the thing is, like I said, it's made out of uh, those um, two pieces of aluminum or three pieces of aluminum. So you can yeah. run over the damn thing with your car and it would probably still be fine. Yeah, true. And it's uh, 790 bucks from uh, HRO. Hmm. So, but it says that they won't ship until late December because of COVID. Yeah, that probably, means like, yeah, probably yeah. means like they really won't ship until February or March. Well, they said August the 1st, and then they said the oh, fall. Okay. And then they said uh, late November, and now they're saying late December. But if you go to the manufacturer's site, the manufacturer site says that they're going to have a batch to ship out before Christmas. And then the next batch oh, is going okay. to be either January 15th or February, depending on what, which one you believe. It says both. So are they actually building them in Russia or someplace yeah, else? I think so. Because the, uh, huh. 
there's two distributors in the world, HRO and uh, what's the other one? It's it's a Swedish outfit called uh, PileUpDX.com. Okay. Anyway, hmm. they supposedly have a battery that snaps on the back, so at least you get uh, almost an internal battery, but still no ATU. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah, so here's the uh, pileup address. But the interesting thing is <coughs> the interesting thing is their cost is $1,110. 890 euros or 111. <laughs> well, that's like th uh, what, $300 more than what HRO is selling them for? But 20 for, uh, part of that is the value added tax yeah, because they include the value added tax and the price. Right. But that's like 26%, right? Yeah, so, I think so. It depends on where you are, but it's a lot of money. But you don't have to pay that. We so won't. Right? Well, no, we wouldn't. But if you buy it in Norway, you would or wherever it is, Sweden, wherever it is. Yeah, but if I, if I order it from Sweden and then they ship it to me here. That's, that's true. That's true. I won't have to pay. So they should have a yeah, non VAT. Sure. They should have a non VAT price, but they don't. Yeah, they anyway, yeah, even twenty six right. even twenty six percent is only two hundred fifty dollars. And it's yeah. three hundred and let's see, seven hundred and ninety. So two ten, three twenty. It's three hundred and twenty bucks more. Of course you want it to pay. Well, tax. plus it's probably there's, yeah, there's probably um, you know, bucks. markup in that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. But this, this is a distributor. So, I mean, you can buy it from yeah. all day, every day, as many as you want, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. But HRO is hmm. too. So, yeah. Anyway, so I placed my order with HRO because I figured that after the first order, it'd be like most of these, is the price is going to go up. So Yeah, really. Especially since they can't seem to provide so, I saw where Universal's going out of business. Yeah, they're go they're pretty much gone except for mail order, uh, whatever inventory's left. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, husband wow. and wife ran it for like forty years and then decided they had enough and so they're retiring and they're instead of selling it, they just shut it down. Yeah, I remember that. I met the guy who uh, started it. Isn't it amazing though? Why would years you try ago. And sell it? What I would, I mean, if it's a going growing going concern. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, it's worth something as a business. Yeah, certainly. But, it's you know, people thing. are funny about people are funny about things like that. Sometimes, you know, if they they start a business, they run it all their lives. They don't want to give it to somebody else because they think they'll wreck the business, and then they'll it'll be a smirch on their reputation. Yeah, and it could be they could run it into the ground and take advantage of the good names sure. of the people who don't know that it was yeah. so up. Right. And and that you know that does happen sometimes, but I still would think that you'd want to get everything out of it you could. Yeah. Uh, oh well. So anyway, they're going to keep an yep. open mail order and sell off all the inventory, and then they'll be gone. Yeah. See, so if you go on the pileup page, it says preliminary release date is January 15. But then if you go, uh, let's see, where else am I? Well, if you go to the order page, it actually, let's see, we're in store, transceivers. Their website is slower than you know what. <laughs> okay, so if you go here, here's the store. Mind the store. Anyway, one of the places on here on this website has said, if you haven't ordered one, don't order one. Because uh, we're not going to ship any until February. But yet, if you look oh, here, okay. this is January 15th, and if you look on HRO's page, it's December. So, yeah. Who knows when it's going to show up, but they took my money. Yeah. So they owe me a radio. 
<laughs> well, I am going to head head out of here. I have absolutely no food. I've put off going to the grocery like one day too long. Oh, geez. so I've got to go to McDonald's and get something to eat. So you got what's so worked right? until. Well, I worked until like well, yeah. I've got it. It used to be open twenty four hours. I don't know if it still is or not, but they don't serve everything all twenty four hours. Oh yeah. So let's see. They serve breakfast. Where 24 the hell hours. is it here? Yeah. So. By the way, if you order a where the... sausage McMuffin with egg, and you don't order it during the breakfast rush, they're yeah. much better. If really? They have, they have to make one or two of them. They're much better than if they make them on the assembly line. Hmm. I found this out coming back from Hambinchen. I stopped in uh, Holbrook at the McDonald's. Yeah. And it's like yeah. 11, 11 o'clock at night and I order an Egg McMuffin. And I get the thing and it's like, wow, what is this? It's like twice as big as the other one. <laughs> <laughs> I so did they give me the wrong thing? What, what is it? <laughs> yeah, really. Got to supersize it. Supersize, supersize it. Muffin. That's right. I want a jumbo English muffin. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck finding some foraging place tonight. Okay. Yeah. They, we've got a. We actually have a curfew here at ten o'clock. But well, uh, past that now. so everything. I know it is, but everything except. Well, I don't know how McDonald's stays open because most food places have to close. Bars have to close. I mean, everything has to freaking well, so close. So are you not allowed to be out on the road at all then? Well, you're. I guess you're, if you're going someplace that's open, I guess you're allowed to be out. So I'm not sure how they police that. Well, so are, are any restaurants open? Uh, I think some carryout places are open. But, but no, all the eat-in places... places are, are closed because we have so. eating places that are open as long as they do social distancing and uh, barriers and yeah like we have that as well but i think those have to close at 10 o'clock oh okay well i just noticed on the COVID most of them get, anyway uh, on the covid page arizona now is pushing 10 percent of the population that's been infected all right 400 well another 70 percent you will yeah. you'll have herd immunity 450,000 is, I mean, we got about what, 5 million, 6 million, something like that. So yeah, something like that. pushing right up against 10% of uh, cases. Yep. Yeah. So oh, anyway, well, uh, it's probably our, about the same here. Our favorite Chinese restaurant is uh, we eat there. We've eaten there quite a bit because they don't let you dine in anymore, but their carryouts open. And so uh -huh. we'll call up and they bring it out and set it on the table. And it's, it's a no touch, uh, you know. Uh, oh, okay. So you like, you can eat it at the table there? No, 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 no. You can or you, you just you pick it up. It, you just pick it up. Or you could do Grubhub. Oh, okay. All those delivery places. Yeah. My experience with those is yeah. like we ordered on Grubhub the first time the other night. And uh, yeah. we ordered from um, a barbecue place. And yeah. the dipshits, they they drop the food on the porch and don't text me it's there. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's that, 45 degrees outside. It doesn't take very long for your food to get cold when it's sitting on the porch. Yeah, really. <laughs> really. I mean, they text me and they say, it'll be there within 10 minutes. And then that's the last I heard from yeah. them. Jeez. Too hard to text me when you drop it on the porch or ring the doorbell or something, you know? Yeah, I mean, right. Anyway, so it was okay. Yeah, it's I mean, not like... Not like Amazon. When I get something delivered by Amazon, my friggin' Alexa turns color. <laughs> <laughs> and your doorbell goes off and your phone buzzes and <laughs> my phone gets my phone gets a text message and an email. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's yeah. like a, a lot of electrons are ruined in that transaction. <laughs> yeah, like what I said to George on the tapper list. Oh the yeah. 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 <laughs> it shut him up though. So there. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, oh, shoot. 
Bruce I mean, well, said he really appreciated yeah, it. Yeah, really. Yep. All right. Okay. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Stay safe. Thanks. Thanks for the hope remote. You're, I'll hope you're well soon. Uh, I can, I'll okay. be able to go out okay. tomorrow and get that thing because I can sneak into the post office and nobody's there because it's in the box. So Yeah, hopefully that, that whole setup will work. That's what I... <laughs> So you think it's just because the remote was, wasn't near it that it didn't come on? I I don't I don't know. I truly don't know how that works. Yeah. Okay. And I don't remember from what I had. I, I mean I had that I used that thing for probably six months and then I bought like a little different deal. Still fire TV, but it was fire TV and not the fire TV stick. So and I don't remember how the original one worked. Okay. Well I'll try it out. Let you know. Okay. All right. All right. Talk to you later. Seven three. Bye. Seven three. Bye.